King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the Savior we serve, and it is, is His flag that we fly. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, while as ransomed ones we sing. Over land and sea, wherever man may dwell, make the glorious tidings known of the crimson banner. Now the story tell, while the Lord shall claim his own. When the great commander from the vaulted sky sounds the resurrection day, then before our king the faint and foe shall die, and the saints shall march away. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss, and the crowned king will toil and sing neath the banner of the cross. We're hearing a lot about flags these days. The U.S. flag, the Confederate flag, even the rainbow flag. And questions about when to put the flag at half mast. It seems to me that every person <coughs> in this world is flying a flag. It may not be visible, and yet it is so true for one's character and behavior and words that whatever we see is our, pur our purpose, Whoever is before us as our leader, we go far in that direction for all the world to see and to know. That is what our lives are all about. What flag are you flying? Or whose flag is it? When and where and how? Oh, we talk about feeding your fire and facing your fear and fighting your foe. To do that, you have to fly your flag. Be bold. Because our king is mightier than the foe, greater than our fear. King of kings, Lord of lords, faithful and true, riding on a white horse, leading his army in triumph. It's time to raise his banner. It's time to show his colors. It's time to live confidently. You know, we were talking about Satan recently as a lion on the prowl, ravenous, prowling about looking for someone to devour. A lion that wants to eat you for lunch. But we would be incomplete if we didn't say there is a greater lion who's going to eat that lion for lunch. And that's the one from the tribe of Judah. He is the one in Revelation who is seen as conquering, invincible, overpowering, before whom every knee will bow, and to whom every tongue will confess. And as he leads his people in triumph, it's not for us to cower in a cave. It's not our place to despair, but to be courageous and strong and outspoken and clear. Because when He does return, He'll be looking for His army. And those who have claimed Him, He will claim. And for that reason, we know, and He knows, that relationship will go on and on. The power of raising the flag. Iwo Jima, a small island 600 miles south of Tokyo, the last territory that U.S. troops recaptured from the Japanese during World War II. And that statue depicts the scene of the flag raising by five Marines and a Navy hospital corpsman that signaled the successful takeover of the island that eventually led to the end of the war in 1945. It may surprise you and me to realize that most of the soldiers at Iwo Jima were only 17, 18, and 19 years old. And that monument that you see in Arlington, Virginia, commemorates all who have lost their lives in war for this country since 1775. Well, what does David M. Rubenstein have to do with all of that? Earlier this year, the importance of this item was so powerful, so well worth preserving, that he donated $5.37 million of his own money so that it might be restored, so that all the generations would see what our country has been through, what our soldiers have sacrificed, and how they have suffered. How much more you and I must invest. You and I must go forward. You and I must surrender what we are and what we have to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. <laughs> Will Durant, in his 10-volume series on the history of the world, one book was titled, Caesar and Christ. 
He said, there's no greater drama in human record than the sight of a few Christians scorned or oppressed by a succession of emperors, bearing all trials with a fierce tenacity, multiplying quietly, building order while their enemies generated chaos, fighting the sword with the word, brutality with hope, and at last defeating the strongest state that history has known. Durant said Caesar and Christ had met in the arena, and Christ had won. These were disciples who flew their flag, who did not shy away from conflict, who were not intimidated, who would not be silenced by the powers that be. And so when we think about our fire and our fear and our foe, we want to shed light now on our master and to think of the part that we play in the battle that's before us. What do all of these individuals have in common? Well, in Mark chapter 2, there's a paralyzed man lowered by four friends through an opening in the roof that they made while Jesus is teaching in a packed house. He tells this paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven, and then take up your mat and walk. And he does, and the scripture said that they were amazed, and they responded, we've never seen anything like this. That man was flying his flag. You talk about a conversation starter. What are you doing with that bed? You're not lying on it. You don't seem to need it. Why is it in your hand? Well, I met this Jesus. And this is what he did for me. In John chapter 5, there's the man who's been at the pool of Bethesda for such a long time. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? He says, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred, as if that would help him. Jesus said, rise and walk and take up your bed. And he did. And the religious leaders criticized him because it was the Sabbath day. You can't do that now. And he said, he who made me well told me to carry this mat. And that's what I'm going to do. Oh, in Mark chapter 5, the man with the legion, the large number of demons. And Jesus cast them out. And then in his right mind, he said, I want to go with you wherever you travel. Jesus said, no, you return home and tell your family and your friends what great things the Lord has done for you. And so in the area of the Decapolis, the ten cities in Greek, he went and told of that encounter he had with Jesus. Oh, in Acts chapter 3, there's that crippled, lame beggar at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. And Peter and John have no money to give, but in that miraculous age, he is raised up and he begins jumping and shouting and thanking God. And in chapter 4, he's there beside them as the apostles are accused by the authorities. And the Bible says they had nothing to say. Each one of these flew his flag. What about you? In this week to come, how will others see your colors, where you stand, who you follow and serve and adore. How will you reflect in the days ahead that seen in Revelation, faithful and true, sitting on the white horse and the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Will you be so bold as to speak His name? Will you spread your influence? Will you let someone know and see and hear something about Jesus Christ? Because you believe that's what he deserves. In Luke 9, here's the message he gave all of us. We've said, fly your flag. He said, carry your cross. Carry your cross. That means you're prepared to die. You could face betrayal and arrest and false accusations. You could be put on trial. You could be harassed. You could be in danger. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross. How often? Every day. And follow me. If you're all about saving your life, you may lose it. 
you lose your life by giving it to Jesus, you're sure to save it. What would it profit you if you had the whole world and you forfeited yourself? Do we dare to be ashamed of Him when we count on Him not to be ashamed of us? When He comes in glory of His Father and of the angels that will be with Him. Turn with me to 1 Peter. I wondered as I studied this week, is there any book in the Bible that tells us how to fly the flag? Well, not in so many words. And yet here, written to Christians exiled, scattered, strangers all over the world, the message of this great letter is not to shirk, not to shrink, but to have an impact for Jesus Christ. Even when the climate is pagan, the culture is going the wrong way, when the people at the top of leadership are leading in the wrong direction. That's the time we see through Peter that we can act as those, look how the book begins, those who are foreknown by God the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, obeying Jesus Christ. Boy, that's a different picture. Those, verse 3, who are raised again with a living hope, Guarded now by God's power until our salvation is revealed. Having a reservation there waiting for us. And in the meantime, the passage says, yes, you'll be put through the fire. You'll be tested. But it's an opportunity for your faith to be shown as genuine, as authentic, as pure. You want to fly your flag. Dare to rejoice. When you are mistreated, when your faith costs you something, when life is tougher because you belong to Jesus, it's what you expected. And then you remember the past, He died and rose. The future, He's returning. And the present, you're protected by His power until that great day comes as you walk by faith in Him. Find joy in the purity of the gold that is your faith. Then starting at verse 13, look at the passage there where it talks about literally girding up the loins of your minds. Some versions just say, prepare. It has to do with the ancient practice that you wore long robes of tying them up around your waist so that you could run or you could carry out a task or you could serve. And the scripture says, do that with your mind and show in holy conduct that you obey God no matter the circumstances. That's why in the book of Acts, the early Christians said we must obey God rather than men. No matter what it means, regardless of where it takes us or what we lose as a result, we have this lamb, spotless and pure, foreknown before the foundation of the world. And we belong to Him. Notice where it says that you're to not be conformed, verse 14, to those former lusts, but now be holy. In what way? In every way. Because that's who He is. Fly the flag of devotion to God. And then I want to look here particularly at verses 9 and following. It's such a paradox. The letter begins, you're aliens, you're scattered, you're away from home, maybe without identity, without a name, without belonging. And then chapter 2 and verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Yes, sir. What am I to do? Proclaim his excellencies. He's on the horse. He's in triumph. There is no enemy or rival that can stand before him. And you are behind him going into battle. Do not be silent. Let your voice be heard. Fly your flag. There's a theme in 1 Peter that relates to leadership. 
and being under the heavy hand, let's say, of a master or a ruler, that's not compassionate and kind, but may instead be harsh and severe. And the scripture says it's just in those settings that you and I can vindicate our relationship with God and show that we are different <coughs> by the fact that we do not retaliate, we do not curse, we do not insult, but we continue to honor the Lord even when we're under such circumstances. And here's the example given that when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile in return. He kept entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. And by his stripes we're healed. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. Walk in his steps. Fly your flag. Dare to serve when the boss is mean. Dare to serve when work is not all that you want it to be. Dare to give at the office when others do not. Dare to take criticism without lashing back in anger and pride. And let the people who will be with you tomorrow and every weekday say, that person has a different flag. These colors I haven't seen before. How can that person not be incensed? The trigger, the fuse, how can they not be brought to rage like people of the world would be? Oh, and then chapter 3, 13 to 22. You know, as I looked through Peter, I wanted to pick one passage that would talk about flying the flag, and then I realized the whole book is about that. So I thought I would just put forward some general ideas and then you in your devotional time with your families at home can take each passage. Like you could talk about 13 to 22 in chapter 3. And don't be intimidated. Don't fear. Don't be troubled. Verse 14. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and respect. And keep a good conscience, verse 16, so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. What am I going to face this week? where I'm going to feel uneasy. I'm going to feel pressured. I'm going to feel like I have to cover up my relationship with Christ. And how will I prepare in advance that I will defend, I will support in a way that's gentle and respectful, not argumentative or quarrelsome, but I'm going to fly my flag by talking about the faith that I have in Jesus Christ. Several places in the book, here chapter 4, 1 through 11, includes this. We must dare to be different in order to fly our flag. In fact, the Bible says here in chapter 4, 4, that we want to surprise people. When we won't talk as they talk, we won't behave as they behave, we won't involve our, we're not interested in the things that are ungodly or impure or wrong. Verse 3 talks about sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. All that's behind you. And so you're set apart. And people notice it. And you're bold because you've been in Revelation and you've seen the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You've imagined the victory. You realize that when the smoke clears and the dust settles, he will be standing, and all those in his army will be there. You say, I can be different. I can show my colors. I can be bold and not intimidated. I can serve and not strike back. I can give and not have to take. I'm not going in the direction of this world. I'm going upward. And because I'm going upward, I'm going outward. And nothing will hold me back. 
Well, then I shouldn't need to suffer. Is that right? No, it's exactly the opposite. The Bible says elsewhere, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Peter writes for inspiration, just be sure that when you do undergo tough times, it's not because you're a crook or a murderer or a lawbreaker, but it's because you wear the name of Christ. So don't be ashamed, but instead glorify God in that name. Chapter 4 and verse 16. If you're reviled, look at verse 13. If you're sharing the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Verse 12, a fiery ordeal, testing. Don't look at this as something strange. It's what distinguishes true soldiers as those who genuinely belong to this King. To fly your flag, dare to lead. What an exciting time it is for the Keller Church of Christ. And what wisdom our elders, our shepherds, our overseers have shown. By thinking about the future, that we might stay with the Word of God. That as Jesus is faithful and true on that horse, we might be faithful and true as those who march under His orders. And that we pray this week fervently, faithfully, asking God to raise up those whom He has equipped to lead, to help, to encourage, to serve. Peter talks about that here. Not in some kind of overpowering, dominating way. Not for sordid gain. Not for selfish motivation. But voluntarily. As an example to the flock. Shepherding under the chief shepherd who is going to appear one day. Jesus Christ gives us victory. Because of what he has accomplished. And for that reason, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because you know that the Lord, in him, your labor is not in vain. You fly your flag when you offer prayer in a restaurant with your family and friends. You fly your flag when you take your Bible to work or school and read it during your break. You fly your flag when you post a scripture on Facebook, when you speak the name of Jesus to a friend, when you talk to your neighbor about God's creation, when you offer to pray for someone in need, when you give friendship to a person that's lonely, when you tell someone what God has done for you, what God means to you, when you do or say anything just because you're a Christian, and for no other reason. You want to feed your fire? Then fly your flag. You want to face your fear? Then fly your flag. You want to fight your foe? Then fly your flag. Raise it for all to see. If it's down, restore it. Renew it. Refresh it. And let's do it together. 40 plus people in California working to carry that flag that others might see. Why do they march differently? Why is their direction not the same as ours? Where do they have their joy and their patience and their perseverance? It's because of the lion of the tribe of Judah. What flag do you fly? What colors do people see? And it will be, will it be evident in your home and in your circle of friends and with your co-workers that you're part of his army and you're confident and bold and courageous. Becoming a soldier of the cross when we're baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. We're buried and then brought back up again from the water. The 
Bible says that we identify with his death and his resurrection and we begin to live new lives. And then as we perhaps struggle with some of the issues we talked about today, we come back to him again and again and again. Fight for that. Let your colors be clear. Come to Jesus Christ as we stand.